Hi, this is Kyle with Stitch International. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to use the Forever Transfer Rib software. The first thing you want to do is open up your software. You'll notice here in the top left that it'll say step one of five. There are five steps in the process, each step having its own task. The first step, you choose your paper. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just select laser dark. You can choose laser light if you're using laser light paper. Use multi-trans if you're using Forever's hard surface paper. But in this case, I'm just going to select laser dark because that's typically what I use the most. So you'll click on it here and then hit select down at the bottom right. This will take you into step two. What you want to do here is select the paper size that you want to print on. In this case, I'm going to use Tabloid XL, which is 13 by 19 or 12 and a half by 19 as it says here. You'll go ahead and click on load file. Search for the image that you want to upload. And hit open. You'll see this green bar start to move. Once it's finished, you'll notice that there's a new file that pops up up here at top. You'll click on that. You'll see it show up in the preview window here. At this point, you can click on it. And you'll notice the green bar kick up again. That means it's moving on to the next step. Now that we're at step three, this is where you can edit some of your colorations. There's a couple different things you can do on this window. The first being is you can select and change a color within that image. So you can go ahead and hit this add tool. You'll see this dialog box pop up. So what you want to do here, if you want to change a color inside your design, is you'll select source and click out here on a color that you'd like to change. For instance, we're going to go ahead and change this purple color here. Once we've selected our source color, we can go ahead and click destination. Destination color is going to be the color you want it to change to. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and make this a nice cyan. We've already got 100 in cyan, so we don't need to change that. We need to get rid of the black here so we can remove the black that's going to be mixed with it. And that'll make it a nice blue cyan color. We'll go ahead and come up here to tolerance. You usually want to make sure this is between 10 or 13. It seems like that's a good number to have it on to get the effect you're looking for. Sometimes you may need to bump it up a little more or down a little more depending on the situation. But we're going to go ahead and hit save. And you'll notice once it loads that we have now changed that color to blue. You can come over here and edit this if you want by hitting the edit button. This will allow you to change what you've created. So say we decided we didn't want that to be cyan, we could, we wanted to make it a yellow color. So we could go ahead and put a zero on cyan. We could bump this up to 100 and you notice it turns yellow. Now you can use different CMYK codes in here. I'm just keeping it simple. But say we wanted to, you know, add in like 10% magenta and 5% cyan or even 30% cyan. We'll get a green color. Um, and say we want a little darker, we could add a little bit of black in there. So you can see how that's changing that color. But anyway, you can edit from here, save it, and it'll load the edit here on the screen. You can also duplicate it. So if you wanted to go ahead and duplicate this, you could do that save it and it'll pop up here twice that kind of makes it easy it already sets it up so you can just go in and edit some coloration if you wanted to or whatever you need to do and then of course you can also delete it here so you just select it and hit delete now down here you can edit the overall coloration of your image you can adjust the brightness you can adjust the contrast your saturation your hue and then your different gammas. So what I like to do sometimes whenever I'm rasterizing something, it can kind of dull out the color because it's pulling in the color of the t-shirt too. So what I like to do is go ahead and bump my saturation up a little bit. I usually try to keep it between five and 15, depending on the print. And you can see it'll start to adjust the colors a little bit over here. Um, if that doesn't quite do it, sometimes I'll bump down to hue and go about five over to the left or I'll go five over to the right. And you'll notice this little number changing and that's the what I'm referring to. So you can do that to help the colors pop a little more or dull them out or whatever you need to do. If that still doesn't quite get it right, then you know I'll move on to brightness and adjust the brightness and maybe adjust the contrast and just work my way through, through it that way until I get the exact colors I'm looking for. Most of the time, however, aside from saturation, you don't really have to adjust much. 
So normally you're gonna see this set up here where it's all zeros. Now you may see the saturation up a little more, but usually this is typically what you'll end up using as far as this goes. But you do have the option to adjust all these to get maybe a different coloration here in the software. Uh, moving on down, you'll have remove color. If you select this, it'll pop up with a dialog box. Um, this is where you can remove certain colors inside of your image. Um, in this case, let's say we wanted to remove this green. So we can select the green color down here. You'll notice it changes the color in this box and gives it a color code up here. We'll hit save. And then you'll notice it hasn't been removed yet. So what you gotta do is change the tolerance. Now, if you're familiar with Adobe or Illustrator, you have a rough idea of what this tolerance does. So basically the lower the tolerance, the more specific it's gonna be about the color it removes. So the lower that tolerance, the, the less range of color it's going to remove. So when you select this, if, say if we hit a one, it's gonna move, remove all the greens that are closest to that color green we selected. And you'll notice it takes a second to load, but you'll not also notice it didn't remove any. So we've gotta be a little more aggressive in our tolerance. So we'll move it up to three and we'll give it a second to load here. And it still didn't remove any of the color. So now we bump it up a little more and sometimes it takes a couple of tries to get there, but once you get the right tolerance level, you'll notice those colors disappear. And we'll bump it up to nine. And there you see it disappear. Now, this is not gonna be perfect. It's not like you would be in your editor. So sometimes it'll remove more color than you want. So that's why I tell people, this is software is not designed to be an editor, but you do have some capability inside of it. You really want to use your Photoshop, your Illustrator, your Corel Draws, your GIMP software, whatever editor you prefer. And GIMP is a free software for anyone who, who needs it. But anyway, you're not going to be able to do a lot of editing inside this software. But you do have some limited um, options here. There's one other setting I want to show here, and this is called your substrate color. If you click on this and say, say you're printing on a a dark blue shirt and you want to see what this design is going to look like on a dark blue shirt you can click on substrate select a dark blue and hit ok and it will put a blue background behind it so you can kind of get an idea of what it looks like on that now in this case it's not going to print this blue this is just for your own viewing so you can see what it's going to look like kind of like a preview before we move on to the next step, if you wanted to save all these settings and use them on different prints and things, you can always hit this manage color settings and hit save. And then this dialog box will pop up. You'll fill in the name and description so you can remember what it is and hit save. And in this case, we're gonna go ahead and call it uh, forever picture. You'll hit save. And then if you wanted to load these settings into a different design that you're working on, you can go ahead and hit load and select your forever picture and the settings will show up for it. Now that we're done with step three, we're gonna go ahead and click on next. On this screen, this is where you control how much white is on the back of your image. Um, whenever you see this, you're gonna notice it's showing just a grayscale. Basically it's showing you the levels of white that it's putting behind each of the parts of your image. So typically, if you're using laser dark, you're always gonna use this 150 coverage. The only time it seems like I ever change this is if I'm doing a hard surface paper, or uh, in other words, I'll bump it up to 200 usually. And then uh, on sometimes on polyester. And the reason um, you would need to do it on polyester is because of dye migration. Um, you'll notice that if you're using 100% polyester, sometimes you'll, the colors just won't be as bright as you intended them to be. And a lot of times it has to do with dye migration. So what you'll do is just click on this and you can bump it up to 200. Now you'll notice you have all the num settings in the world up to 400% if you really wanted to, which would make everything have a ton of white behind it. But typically you're gonna stay between 150 and 200 depending on what you're working with. So the next setting on your list here is underfilling. I typically use one device pixel a majority of the time. What this is gonna do, it's gonna choke back the white around the edge of your image so that it doesn't show. 
Um, you can go a little higher if you need to, but I find that either one or two device pixels usually takes care of it. Um, I usually always start with one and then I move up the two if I need to. Now, the next setting here is preserve partial transparency. I always check this box. Um, in any given image, you're always gonna have pixels that are supposed to be transparent. But if you don't check this box, it tells the printer to go ahead and put white behind those pixels. And what happens is those they show up a lot brighter than they're supposed to. So if you select preserve partial transparency, it's going to remove the white behind those pixels so that way where it's supposed to be a transparent pixel, it is. These bottom two settings here, they only show up if you're using the 9541 and you'll never change these. These typically always stay the same. And then that goes for this setting here too. What this does is actually just turns off the white behind the back of the image. And for anything you're gonna do for white toner transfer um, or toner transfer images, you're gonna want white behind the image. So you'll leave that on. So the only thing I ever really change on this screen, 99% of the time is gonna be your underfilling and your preserved tra partial transparency. Now these will reset with each image you load in. However, if you go back to print an image, it's, it's gonna save it to that specific image. Moving on, we're gonna go ahead and click next. So now we're on step five. This is where you set everything up on your printer. Now you'll wanna choose your printer, how many copies you wanna print. You'll wanna go ahead and mirror your image if it's not mirrored. You'll notice back here that this image is already mirrored, so I don't have to mirror it. So I can leave this on none. Otherwise I would have clicked mirror horizontal. This next section covers the mask settings. This first setting is use screening from printer. Typically if you wanna print something without a mask, so in other words, no holes in the toner, you would wanna use this. Um, I usually use this setting for if I'm doing left chest logos or if I'm gonna do something that doesn't have a lot of surface area of toner being laid down. Uh, so like if it's all text or if it's just some lines or something like that, typically I will use uh, this screening from printer setting. Uh, this screening as configured is not something you'll probably ever use. It's a little more advanced version of the screening from printer and it's just not, you'll never really need it. Um, it allow, when you click on it, it does allow you to change how much ink and, and stuff is being used in the various colors, but really you'll never need to change that. You've already changed a lot of that in previous screens. So moving on to bright media. So this is using screening as configured as mask recommended for bright media. Basically that means white material. So if you're using a white shirt, a white bag, a white whatever, you'll wanna use this setting. And what this does, it removes all the white from the image and uses the white from the shirt to replace it. Uh, which is very nice because one, it makes the shirt softer, helps make it more durable. And then also applying a mask to the rest of the colors as well. So that way it increases both that durability and that uh, washability and things like that. This dark media setting does the exact same thing except for your black shirts or your black bags or whatever you're using. So it removes the black out of the image and uses the black from the shirt or the bag or whatever it may be to fill those colors in. And then last but not least is kind of the universal setting. This works for any color t-shirt or bag or whatever you're doing. And you'll notice when you click on micro mask, it allows you to adjust this micro mask percentage, which basically helps you control the distance between the holes. With the dark media and bright media setting, it does it for you automatically based on how light or how dark that color is. So some very unique settings. I typically leave this on 20%. It's seems to be a pretty good spacing for what I like to do. Now this mask setting is going to control how big the holes themselves are. I typically like to use 25. I feel like it's nice, happy medium, helps preserve detail, that kind of thing. But you can certainly go higher. You can go up the, all the way up to 40, which makes them even smaller. This uh, dot shape controls the shape of the actual holes. I typically like to use Euclidean or round. I feel like those do a pretty good job. Um, you can use squares or lines. Um, there's some other settings in here, rhombus, elliptical, um, some predetermined positions here. I typically use Euclidean the most, but these other ones do give a nice effect, especially if you're doing something with a lot of detail, like someone's hair, this lines option is kind of nice too. 
But like I said, I usually use a Euclidean and it does a pretty good job. This next section is going to cover the paper itself. Basically, if you're going to be using a 9541 or a C711, you're gonna want this on transparency if you're gonna use laser dark. If you're using something other than laser dark, such as laser light or uh, multi-trans or the Magic Touch CPM 6.2 hard surface paper, um, you're gonna to wanna to use the recommended media type. Um, but for dark laser dark in this case, I would use transparency. You'll notice you have a whole list of options here. Now, if you're using the 8432, it's gonna be user type one that you use for laser dark. But all these settings are included with the paper. They'll have a pamphlet inside the box that you can refer to. And every, every type of paper is different and every printer is different. Um, you'll wanna always have this uh, automatic tray detection selected. You'll have options to choose multi-purpose or man manual feed. Um, and then, but typically automatic trade detection will do the job for you. Now in your print settings for the 9541 and I believe the C711 as well, you can actually change it to automatically direct it to your multi-purpose tray so you, you don't have to hit the button every time. And with the 8432, you can just leave it exactly how it's set up out of the box and it'll do the same thing. You can also adjust your offset. So if you notice for whatever reason that when you print something that it's a little bit off from center um, or it's not printing perfectly centered on the page, you can adjust the offset. You can do it in several different dimensions. I typically choose inches since I'm here in the US, but you want you can offset it. I noticed that whenever I set up my 9541, it was just a little bit off from center, so I went ahead and adjusted these to compensate. Uh, most of the time you won't have to, but in this case I did. Everything else here is, is something you probably will never change. We usually recommend to go ahead and use no ICC profile. And then of course, this is going to be set to its default setting. Once you finish setting up your print here, you can preview. So if you click on preview, you'll notice it pop up and show you a brief preview of your image. This isn't going to be the most perfect representation of how it's going to print, but at least gives you a really good idea of how it's laid out and how it's gonna look. You can zoom in by using this slider here. You'll notice each time you click, it moves closer and closer. And now you can kind of see the holes in the image. This is gonna be your mask. Now, if you didn't want that, of course, you'd use screening from printer, but this kind of gives you an idea of how it's going to look on the page. And it does always look better when it's actually pressed to the shirt. We can go ahead and close this. Now, once you've got everything the way you like it, you'll go ahead and hit print and it'll load and then send it to the printer.